Hello and welcome to this just-in-time training module Primer for Healthcare Providers that is presented to you by the Radiation Injury Treatment Network and Emory University. We would like to acknowledge the Radiation Emergency Medical Management website and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for the use of some of their resources in this presentation. After completion of this module, you will be able to Describe what happens when an improvised nuclear device or IND detonates. List the types of injuries from an IND detonation. Become familiar with basic radiation physics and personal protection principles. And become familiar with the medical evaluation and management of patients transferred to an RITN center. An improvised nuclear device, IND, is a type of nuclear weapon. When it detonates, it gives off four types of energy a blast wave, intense light, heat, and radiation. When an IND explodes, a large fireball is created. Everything inside this fireball vaporizes and is carried upward. It looks like a mushroom-shaped cloud from a distance. The material in the cloud is composed of radioactive atoms and radioactive debris. These cool down as radioactive fallout that is carried by the wind and can end up miles away from the explosion. Fallout is radioactive and can irradiate people on its path and contaminate the environment that it lands on. The intense blast wave generated by the detonation of an IND will lead to three zones of damage. For example, a 10 kiloton IND will cause a severe damage zone that has a radius of approximately 0.5 miles. Victims who are located in this zone are not likely to have survived. The moderate damage zone has a radius of one mile approximately and includes victims with severe but potentially survivable injuries. The light damage zone extends beyond the moderate damage zone and has a radius of approximately two to three miles. Victims in this area have minor traumatic injuries but can be exposed to high doses of radiation if they happen to be present unsheltered in the path of the fallout plume. As we discussed a few slides ago, the IND detonation generates a radioactive debris cloud that emits high levels of radiation as it dissipates in the environment away from ground zero of the detonation. Victims who are located in this zone and are not properly sheltered may receive high doses of radiation that can lead to severe acute radiation injuries and acute radiation syndrome or ARS. This dangerous fallout zone may spread tens of miles away from ground zero and expose people who are far away from the blast zones and therefore otherwise uninjured. These patients could require transfer to an RITN center for care. The radiation dose emitted from this dangerous fallout plume will fortunately decrease during the first 24 hours relatively rapidly as the, as the radioactive material decays. Radioactive material is likely to have deposit, however, on a large surface area which may create the need for a large number of people to be evacuated. As you have learned so far, an IND causes a large number of traumatic injuries, in addition to radiation injuries. So let's go ahead and explain what is radiation and what it does to the, to the body. Radiation is energy that travels in space. It can be non-ionizing or ionizing. Non-ionizing radiation is not energetic enough to remove electrons off of an atom and is therefore not able to damage cells. The effect of non-ionizing radiation is heat. Think of a microwave heating a bagel in your kitchen. On the other hand, ionizing radiation is present around us and is released from radioactive atoms that undergo radioactive decay to reach a more stable, less energetic state. This form of radiation is energetic enough to cause damage to cells and ionize the atoms. Remember that radioactive atoms occur naturally, like radium and uranium, or are man-made, like cesium and technetium. There are four types of ionizing radiation that can be emitted from a radioactive atom and are relevant to our discussion today. Gamma rays are like X-rays. They are able to travel several yards in air and can penetrate the body and deposit their energy in internal organs, like the bone marrow, for example. Alpha and beta particles travel a much shorter distance in air and are not able to penetrate the body and irradiate internal organs when they are released from, radio from a radioactive source outside the body. However, when this radioactive material is inside the body, 
These alpha and beta particles can deposit their energy in surrounding cells and cause significant damage. Finally, neutrons are able to penetrate the body and can make atoms radioactive. When released from a nuclear device detonation, they can make debris radioactive. After an IND detonation, the most important way that patients become exposed to radiation is from exposure to gamma rays emitted during the detonation itself or from the radioactive fallout. Radioactive material can also deposit on the skin. In these cases, high-energy beta particles can irradiate the skin and lead to superficial skin burns referred to as beta burns. As we just described, people can become exposed to high doses of ionizing radiation emitted during the detonation of the IND or from radioactive fallout. This can occur without any contamination of the person with radioactive material. In these cases, the person poses no hazard of secondary exposure or contamination to others. Think of someone who has just received a chest x-ray in your hospital. On the other hand, radioactive material may deposit over the surface or inside the body of a person located in the fallout zone without proper sheltering. This person can contaminate others and the surrounding environment. He or she can secondarily expose others to the radiation emitted from the contamination over or inside their body. According to current plans and guidance, patients who are transferred to an RITN center would have been evaluated for the presence of external contamination and would have received proper decontamination prior to arrival. Healthcare providers can limit their potential secondary radiation exposure and contamination with radioactive material by taking a few simple steps. They should keep to a minimum the time they spend near a patient contaminated with radioactive material. They should maximize the distance from the source of contamination and use appropriate personal protective equipment. Lastly, they should also monitor the radiation dose they are exposed to with a dosimeter. When caring for a patient at an RITN center, standard precautions are sufficient. These include the use of protective gown, goggles, and a mask like a surgical mask or an N95. Going back to the IND detonation scenario, victims may have different types of injuries. The majority of patients will have traumatic injuries, including thermal burns. Isolated radiation injuries will also be present. Patients may also have combined injuries from radiation and trauma, which will worsen their prognosis for recovery. Similarly, patients with comorbid conditions like heart disease or diabetes will have a more severe illness and potentially a worse prognosis for recovery. Patients who were exposed to the flash of light may develop a flash blindness and retinal injuries in some cases. Also remember that mental health effects will also be common in survivors of an IND detonation. The patients who will be transferred to an RITN center are those who have sustained primarily radiation injuries. According to current plans, the RITN center patient is one who has received a significant radiation dose and is therefore likely to develop the acute radiation syndrome. RITN centers are not supposed to receive patients that have suffered significant traumatic injuries or who are contaminated with radioactive material. As we just described, the RITN center will care for patients who have, who have or are at risk for developing the acute radiation syndrome or ARS. ARS is a complex disease that occurs when a person's entire or most of the body is exposed to penetrating ionizing radiation like gamma rays. The exposure must occur during a short period of time usually minutes to a few hours. The pathophysiological basis of ARS lies in the death of inherently radiosensitive stem cells in the bone marrow, gastrointestinal tract, and other organs with active cell turnover. ARS evolves over four stages. After exposure to radiation, the patient enters the prodromal stage. Although the stem cells have already died, the secondary clinical consequences are not apparent yet. The symptoms are nonspecific and due to inflammation. In this stage, patients will complain of vomiting, headache, fatigue, fever, and diarrhea. After a lapse in time, the patient feels better during the latent stage, before entering the manifest illness stage that is due to the death of the, th of the stem cells and the secondary clinical consequences. The duration of the entire illness and the individual stages depend on the radiation dose received. The higher the dose received, the more compressed are the durations of individual stages and of the entire illness. After the manifest illness stage is complete, patients will either recover or die from their illness. It is important to note here that patients who survive the ARS can also develop delayed effects of acute radiation exposure years after the initial incident. 
These include the formation of cataracts and pulmonary fibrosis. Cancer and leukemia can also occur in survivors of the ARS, as has been seen in atomic bomb survivors. Now let's go back to ARS. Patients with this syndrome can manifest one, of, one or more sub-syndromes depending on the dose of radiation received. The higher the dose received, the more severe the illness and the earlier the onset of clinical manifestations. Patients who are transferred to an RITN center are those who are likely to develop the hematopoietic subsyndrome of ARS or HARS. Currently, patients who develop the gastrointestinal or the, or the neurovascular subsyndromes of ARS are not likely to survive. Of course, remember that the presence of comorbid injuries or concomitant trauma or burns will greatly increase the severity of the illness and worsen the prognosis for recovery. ARS usually will also be accompanied by some skin damage. Cutaneous radiation syndrome or CRS describes the complex pathological syndrome that results from acute radiation exposure to the skin. Remember, however, that it is also possible to receive a damaging dose to the skin without symptoms of ARS. This is especially true with localized, expo localized exposures or with, or with exposures to beta particles from external contamination of the skin. HARS will manifest days to weeks after the radiation exposure. The lymphocytes are very radiosensitive, which explains why the absolute lymphocyte count will rapidly decrease. The neutrophil count will decrease as well after a brief rise. Patients will then become neutropenic and become susceptible to infections. Albeit at a slower rate, the red blood cell count and platelet counts will also decrease. The patients will also become susceptible at that point to bleeding. Recovery from HARS will occur when the bone marrow recovers. This happens if enough stem cells have survived the initial radiation insult. As you have heard in previous slides, the radiation dose received is an important factor that will affect the severity of resulting ARS. There are several ways to estimate the dose of radiation received by an individual patient. A detailed history of the location of the patient with relation to the site of detonation and the dangerous fallout zone will help in dose estimation. Sheltering in a home or building after the detonation will also decrease the radiation dose received. The presence and time of onset of prodromal symptoms like vomiting will also aid in dose estimation. In general, patients who start vomiting within four hours of exposure to radiation have received a significant dose and are likely to develop ARS. Unfortunately, vomiting is a non-specific clinical sign which makes it a less desirable dose estimation tool than serial absolute lymphocyte counts. Serial absolute lymphocyte counts or even a single absolute lymphocyte count measurement can provide an estimate of the radiation dose received. Finally, the gold standard for radiation dose assessment is a dicentric chromosome assay that consists of counting abnormally shaped chromosomes that have two centromeres. Unfortunately, this assay is not widely available and requires several days for completion. Currently, additional biodosimetry assays are in development. The management of ARS consists primarily of good supportive care. In some cases, the management can be initiated and maintained in an outpatient setting. This depends on several factors, the severity of the exposure, signs and symptoms, the patient comorbid conditions and associated injuries, and the healthcare system capacity and expected total number of patients. For example, a patient can be triaged for outpatient care and follow-up if the estimated radiation dose is less than 2 gray or if the absolute neutrophil count is greater than 1000 cells per microliter in a patient without fever or other signs of infection. The supportive care for ARS consists of IV fluid resuscitation, neutropenic precautions, blood products when needed, nutrition, antiemetics, antidiarrheals, analgesics, antimicrobials, and psychological support. Additionally, colony stimulating factors or myeloid cytokines are given to patients who suffer from the hematopoietic subsyndrome of ARS. The purpose of these myeloid cytokines is to stimulate the bone marrow to produce neutrophils, which will decrease the duration of neutropenia the risk of infection, and potentially the risk of death. The US FDA has approved currently Nupogen and Nulasta for HARS. These drugs can be administered when the radiation dose received is estimated to be greater or equal than 2 gray, or when the ANC or absolute neutrophil count is less than 500 cells per microliter. It is better to administer these drugs during the first 24 hours, so do not delay administration if a CBC is not readily available. If the patient presents after 24 hours, these drugs should still be administered as soon as possible.
For Nupogen, the FDA-approved label recommends obtaining a baseline CBC and then serial CBCs approximately every third day. Nupogen can be discontinued when the absolute neutrophil count remains greater than 1,000 cells per microliter for three consecutive CBCs. Nupogen can also be discontinued if the ANC is greater than 10,000 cells per microliter after a radiation-induced nadir. For Nulasta, the FDA-approved label recommends 6 mg of Nulasta given in two doses, one week apart, subcutaneously. Finally, stem cell transplant can be performed on patients who do not recover using the initial therapies. Although thousands of victims may be transferred to an RITN center, there will be very few who would benefit from stem cell support. These patients will be carefully selected by the RITN providers. Finally, I would like to leave you with a list of resources that you can consult for additional study. Thank you for your attention.